In, in what ways would you say you're an aggressive batsman? Well, I, I've always liked to take control of the situation. Uh, I've always been a, a, a kind of a player who would walk into a situation and, and turn the situation towards in the favor of my team. Um, and that's why I think I'm, I'm an aggressive batsman because a lot of people, they would go in and they would be wary of the situation, whether they want to attack or not. My game is totally counter-attack. My game is, if, if I look at, you know, spaces in the field, I think of the fact that I can score runs here and I don't feel like I might get out. So you have two ways of, of approaching your skill. Either you give in to the opposition's plans and their mind games, or you believe in yourself and say, everyone's looking at this as a pressure situation, but I look at it as an opportunity. So I go in with that mindset, and eight out of 10 times, it, it happens in a way that I'm able to counterattack. And explain the role that angles play. Angles play a huge role um, in terms of batsmanship as well. Sometimes you have to, so basically what we, what we have in cricket is, um, we have the batting crease, which is a line, which traditionally you stand either side of the line, and that's the normal setup of a batsman. But sometimes when, so if you play in England, the ball swings, it moves around. You know, when the bowler bowls the ball, so in baseball you don't have the ball moving around so much, but in cricket you have a lot of variation with the ball where the ball has a seam stitch to it. So when it pitches on the surface, it can go either way. Mm -hmm. It swings in the air because of the conditions, because of the shine on the ball. So there's so many variables that you need to counter. And batting is about a split second of a decision. If I make the wrong decision, I sit outside and I clap all day. So the precision of that split second has to be so good. And you have to keep countering it and keep being in the right mindset every ball of the game, every second of the game. It's tiring at the end of the day as well, mentally. But to counter those kind of things, if you stand in your normal sort of traditional position, you have more chances of getting out. So sometimes you cut angles in a way that you stand in a different place to make the bowler do something different. So those are the things that work really well in your favor in cricket. How does visualization help with that? It is everything for me. How so? So if, if you're going to play um, an overseas tour, say to Australia or England or something like that, I literally sat down two, three months before and I've made a decision in my head that I'm going to take their best bowler on. And when I train in the gym, when I'm practicing, regularly there are visuals running in my head, me dominating that bowler. When I train, I have music on, I'm putting myself in a situation where that guy is bringing the heat onto me and I'm countering that and you know, that becomes such a reality in your head and invariably when I went into that situation, I ended up dominating that guy in their own home conditions. And what specifically are you seeing when you're visualizing? <clears throat> um, I'm actually seeing smashing that bowler all over the field. So I, I actually feel that emotion in my heart and I can feel that this is going to happen. And you, you tune your head or you tune your mind in a way that it's so convincing in your mind that when you're in that situation, your body just takes over because it's already re already registered in your mind. And when that happens, you feel like, wow, man, this is so powerful. Because if something looks difficult and if you don't convince yourself to go out there and achieve the opposite, you're never going to be able to do it. You can't just land in a place and say, I'll see what happens. That way, you, your chances of succeeding become very, very low. Uh, your first year in the IPL, you're playing with some of the best players in the world. Uh, your coach, Raj Kumar, said that your shortcoming was overconfidence. How so? It was. I, I lost my way. I drifted quite a bit. And um, eventually, I had the worst season I could have. And I had discipline issues. And I, I actually lost my way pretty badly. You know, I just saw this whole frenzy and this attention on me and suddenly playing with the biggest stars in the world. And they make you feel welcome. They make you feel friendly and you feel like, I'm the man, you know, I'm, I'm everything and I, I can do anything I want. So, yeah, I did lose my way. And again, he pulled me up. He called me. He's like, you need to get your act right. And Is I that what he said specifically? Yeah, he said, I've heard things and you need to... Be careful, you need to stay away from all this stuff that's been happening. And, and what was the stuff? Just being distracted, just partying, just not that focused, not 
focusing on my training, my diet, nothing. I just, my graphs just kept going down. And I didn't realize it. I was like, I got so carried away just wanting to be around these people and doing, you know, anything just to be socially accepted and, you know, just to be part of groups and wanting to hang out with cool people and stuff like that. And then after that, I realized that I was heading into a totally wrong direction. In what ways do you think you struggled at times handling hecklers? Well, I've had many instances where I lost my cool with people who would um, sort of poke me or um, urge me to, you know, lose my temper. Like what, I, what would get to you the most? I think the stuff that would get to me the most was bad sledging. Like if someone, so sledging, I don't know if you know about sledging. Sledging is basically when you're playing on the field and, and people say nasty things to you just so you can get out and make you lose your focus. So when those kind of nasty things happen, I just lost my cool completely. And people would get personal as well. A lot of the time, they would get personal. And these are other players? Or other players spectators? from other countries. Okay. And I would like totally what would they not, say? They would say stuff which was, oh, this is the last time he's going to ever play for his country. And, you know, this is it. And you're never going to see his face again. And those kind of nasty things. And he felt like, yes, you want to get someone out, but you can't, you can't snatch someone's life away from them by saying stuff like that, you know, it's if a young guy comes in and he actually believes in it, you could destroy his whole life. I can understand people lose their temper and, you know, um, they fight against each other, they swear at each other, but you don't wish that someone never comes back to play the sport that they've loved playing since they were kids. So those kind of things would rile me up and then the crowd plays a big role as well. The crowd riled me up as well a few times and one time I flicked a finger <laughs> I flicked the middle finger at the crowd as well and it was so funny in Australia. I had had enough of the, the, the crowd coming at me every time and you know I would, I would hear stuff which was so nasty and I was like, man this is so bad and I, I never thought this is going to be the case playing cricket at the highest level. So I flicked the middle finger and then next day I come in, the match referee, the guy who's in charge of the code of conduct. He gave you a pass. He called me into the office. And he said, so what happened yesterday? And I said, nothing. <laughs> what happened? He said, what happened at the boundary line yesterday? I said, nothing happened. It was all good. The crowd was saying some things and I just went on with it. I didn't say anything. And then boom, he drops this newspaper in front of me. I have a, a 14, 15 inch long picture of myself in, on the front page of an Australian newspaper with my middle finger right up there and it was in your blood. And Immediately I said, I said, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I immediately accepted, I said, I'm so sorry. Please don't ban me, I will never do this again. So he took half of my match fees away and then he warned me and then he was like, you should be careful, you're young, you don't want to spoil your career. And, but I kept learning with my mistakes. Well, why did an Australian newspaper call you the Donald Trump of world sport? <laughs> yeah, a lot of nasty things happened um, back in the day. I think both, both sides were quite naive. I was quite naive to to lose my temper, you know, they were quite um, naive to form a judgment so quickly and um, we always think that our side of the story is right. So that's exactly what happened in that situation. They really took it to the next level and I was like, well, it is what it is and I've called it upon myself. Why'd your mom give you a locket and gold chain to help with your temper? Well, it's something, um, it's a sea pearl stone, which is supposed to be calming and people in India believe in a lot of, wearing a lot of stones and, you know, it has a scientific meaning to it as well because of the, the, uh, the elements of the stone and the magnetic field around us and how it Im impacts, you know, certain characteristics in us as well. So she gave me one saying, this is going to help you with your temper. I don't know to what extent it helped me, to be honest, but yeah, the effort was certainly there, but I kept losing my temper. What, why do you think you've since had so much success in calming yourself down? Well, again, you learn. After a while, you feel like you, you really don't have any competition. It's just all made up in your own head. And, and at the end of the day, you're just competing with yourself. So my, my main focus now is to not disappoint myself first as a person and then impact the people immediately who are connected to me immediately, you know. So they see if I have a downfall and things will become negative around me. So I become more aware of my, my mistakes. I become more aware of if I mess up at any time, 
um, I need to be the first one to correct it rather than you know someone having to come and say you're going down the wrong, wrong direction. So I think acceptance and awareness has certainly changed my life.